The Christian Middle Ages were in many ways a world considerably different than ours. This was a world filled with beliefs fashioned and formed by the immediate context. That context was different than a modern worldview. This was a world firmly related to the supernatural, a world where people thought differently than most 21st century people do. We must avoid the enormous condescension of posterity, as well as make every effort to avoid psychological anachronism. Thinking, assuming, they thought just like we do. This was a world where religion and the church played a crucial role. The advent of Antichrist, the near tangible presence of the devil, and the impending fearful last judgment were components of that world. These elements helped to form the fabric of the Middle Ages, which was a world living in expectation of the end of all things. One of the keys to unlocking the mysteries of the eschatological worldview in medieval church history can be found in consideration of Antichrist, the Devil, and the Last Judgment. Neither God nor the Devil have any history. Their history is really that the history of ideas or concepts. Medieval European Christians generally didn't question those concepts. There was a God, there was a Devil, there was Heaven, and there was hell. There was very little speculation about the veracity of those concepts. Now to speak about Antichrist, about the devil, about the whore of Babylon, these are all biblical concepts, and the last judgment is to speak about evil, and to speak about ideas concerning evil, and it's to speak about death in all of its profundity, its certainty, and its finality. The recently deceased German theologian and New Testament scholar Ernst Kasemann once said that apocalypticism was the mother of all Christian theology. The four horsemen of the apocalypse, the last book of the Christian Bible, the apocalypse of St. John, now come, these four horsemen come galloping into the mentality, into the lives of European Christians. Now apocalypticism, based etymologically on the Greek word for revelation, has been understood as connected to the end of the world. When we speak about the revelation of Jesus Christ as John did, it's connected to the end of the world. And in this type of writing and literature, there is the pervasive use of esoteric concepts and imagery. In the Old Testament, we have an example of apocalyptic literature in the book of Daniel. In the New Testament, the revelation of St. John. Eschatology and theology is that branch of doctrine dealing with last things. Within Christendom in the Middle Ages, there is clearly an obsession and I think that's the right word to use, an obsession with the coming end of the world. And with that obsession, with the end of things, there's the fear of hell, a fear of the devil and his demons, which figured so much more prominently into their world than it does into our world. There was a fear of Antichrist and the expectation of last judgment. I would argue that these three elements, the Antichrist, the Devil, and the Last Judgment, form the pillars of the negative side of the med medieval eschatological worldview. In the end, there's only two kinds of people, the saved and the damned, the good and the bad. There's no in-between, there's real, there's no middle. Now the violence of hell, which Scripture speaks of, in which we're going to look at specifically on this occasion, the violence of hell was mirrored in the violence of the late medieval society. Late medieval Europe, the church itself, was a period of cruelty, and late medieval Europe was a time of judicial cruelty. In late medieval Europe, I'm speaking of the period between about 12 and 1500, 
knew only two extremes, total punishment or mercy. This was an age of extremes. There's a general rule at this time in history that everything that happens visibly in the world can be done by demons. There's a preoccupation with the demonic. And the pervasiveness of apocalyptic thinkings at all levels of society in the, the Middle Ages is clearly apparent. I want to look at the three elements, Antichrist first, then the devil, then the last judgment. In the thinking of medieval Christians, Antichrist was an eschatological figure that comes at the end of time. He's the embodiment of evil, or she is the final enemy. Gender really wasn't an issue. Antichrist, by virtue of the term, was everything that Christ is not. In fact, it's not just the opposite, it's an active opposite, Antichrist. Sometimes Antichrist was regarded as the incarnate devil, but often Antichrist is really a separate entity altogether. Antichrist is the central figure in medieval eschatology. Now for the Middle Ages, the appearance of Antichrist was a sign, was an indication of the imminent return of Christ, the consummation of all of history, the end of the world, the end of human history. But who in the world is this shadowy, feared figure known as Antichrist? Is this entity demonic or human? Is it a Jew or not? Is it one person, one entity, or many? Is it a false teacher or an imperial persecutor? Is Antichrist just a symbol of evil or is it a real historical character? There were efforts in the Middle Ages to identify the Antichrist just as there have been in our own time in the past generation, people trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. Whoever and whatever Antichrist is, it's the inversion of everything that Christ is, but where does he come from? Where does this Antichrist come from? Well, many identified Antichrist as coming from the margins of society. Others, such as the 12th century Abbas Hildegard of Bingen, saw a vision of Antichrist emerging from the church itself. There is a Czech manuscript which has an illumination of a church door being opened and inside the church you see the seven-headed beast holding in its clutches a pope, three bishops, <clears throat> and a cardinal. Let me read from Hildegard von Bingen, a book that she wrote completed around 1151. And the image of the woman whom I had seen previously before was again shown to me. She's a mystic, if I can digress, and we'll be talking about mysticism on another occasion. So she has this vision. But this time I could see her completely, this woman, from the middle of her womb downwards as well. From her breast down, she was covered with black scaly spots. In her womb, there appeared a monstrous and totally black head with fiery eyes, ears like those of a donkey, nostrils and mouth like a lion, gnashing with a huge open mouth and sharpening its horrible teeth in a terrible way. From her womb to her ankles, she appeared all bloody. Then the monstrous head emerged completely from the woman with a great crash so that the entire woman was shaken in all her members. Something like a, gra a great mass of excrement was attached to the head. This is the birth of Antichrist as seen by a spiritual personality of the 12th century. Antichrist is a key character in the Christian understanding of history. He or she represents the antithesis of Christ at the end of the world. This being is the terrible leader of evil, the most powerful in a long history of wicked persecutors of Jesus and the Church of Christ. A type of Antichrist was the magician, Simon Magus, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, whom the devil uses to deceive. In the first century, Apostle John writes a letter 
in which John says the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. Now the textual key to our understanding of Antichrist, to the Christian understanding of Antichrist, is the apocalypse of St. John. The Revelation is a coded script. We don't have the key. Uh, well, the key was lost centuries ago. It's apocalyptic literature. And I've explained before what apocalyptic literature is. It's representative of a genre that's rooted in the Hebrew world. The main components of this text were very well known in the Middle Ages, both through sermons and iconographically, visual images. John has a vision of Christ on the Greek island of Patmos where he's been interned by the emperor. He's directed to write about the past, the present, and the future of Jesus Christ. There's a great book that has seven seals which only Christ can open. The seals are opened revealing various aspects of human history. After all the seven seals have been opened, there's a great silence which falls across the heavens. This is followed by cosmic calamity. An army of locusts led by a demonic king arises from the pit and kills a third of humankind. Well, we've got the answer to that. In the 14th century, one third of humankind died because of the Black Death. And there were individuals who believed and saw this as part of the manifestation of Antichrist. Many regarded the plague as eschatological. They wore amulets, charms to ward off the plague. Witnesses who preach of God are killed by the beast from the abyss after 1,260 days. This is the advent of Antichrist. There's earthquakes. There are more catastrophes that happen. Hope now is only in Christ. There's a war in the heavens. A dragon engages the archangel Michael. And again, there are visual images in medieval sources where Archangel Michael and a, de and a demon are struggling for the soul of a deceased person. And here's the two of them fighting over the soul. This is part of how medieval Christians saw the world and understood reality. A monster arises from the sea. That monster is given demonic power. A third beast then appears. People are forced to worship the image of the beast and receive the mark of the devil. Six, six, six. Antichrist makes war on the saints of the Most High. Cosmic war breaks out between God and the devil, between good on one hand and evil on the other. But we know the end of the story. God wins. Satan is thrown into the pit. Antichrist is cast down. Final judgment ensues. Now these visions and events written of by the writer of the Apocalypse, whether that was Apostle John or someone else, became features of Christian iconography from Carolingian times. Now Antichrist is never described in biblical texts, but commentators and artists offered their interpretation of what the Antichrist was, and there's an evolution. The imagery of the Antichrist with the devil and the inhabitants of hell is instructive. The Garden of Delights, uh, a work of art from the late 12th century, was a theological encyclopedia assembled and illustrated at the convent of Mont Saint-Odile under the direction of the abbess. The original, alas, was destroyed in 1870, but a copy had been made prior to that, so we're still able to look at this particular piece of art. If you look carefully into this image of hell, Lucifer sits on his throne in the lower right hand corner and is identified as Satan. The cast in this hellish drama are identified. Those who submitted the temptations, the Jews are there, the warriors are there, soldiers, false clerics are all there. The damned look on from the flaming frame of the picture. Note that some of them are holding their noses because it was commonly believed that the devil smelled very badly and you could not abide the scent of the devil. Satan presides over hell in a parody of secular power in this depiction. Sitting on a throne 
with clawed feet. His throne has animal heads coming out the side, which devour hapless human victims who've gone to hell. His taloned legs crush the heads of others. Notice in the lower right-hand corner that the devil holds baby Antichrist in his arms. It's a parody of Mary with Jesus. Antichrist is the son of the devil. Antichrist is born of an incestuous relationship between a father and a daughter, understood in medieval theology as Satan and the great whore of Babylon. And Antichrist is born in Babylon. Notice on the lower left-hand side of the illumination that the demon is leading a friar into the depths of hell. Now after a brief digression, I want to turn to the devil, but before we look at the devil as part of the way medieval Christians thought, we need to move from Antichrist to the devil by way of one man named Joachim of Fiora, a prominent medieval personality whose importance for this discussion is paramount. Joachim of Fiora lived between about 1135, died in 1202. 12th century Cistercian monk in Italy, later left the Cistercian order and founded the Florensian order, which none of you have probably heard about, but it was approved in 1196. So profound was the Florensian order, it experienced profound growth. The Fourth Lateran Council declared it to be one of the four pillars of the church. It's gone. It didn't last. It was amalgamated later with the Cistercians in 1570. Now Joachim's life is fairly unexceptional, hardly worth the bother. His importance, however, is with his thinking and with what he wrote. And he has to be regarded as a significant figure for the history of apocalyptic theory. Dante and the liturgy of the Florensian order refer to him as having a prophetic spirit. His orthodoxy was questioned and the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 did condemn his criticism of Peter Lombard's Trinitarian doctrine, but it didn't pass any evaluation on other aspects of his theology which would be the most influential of the uh, Joachite uh, tradition. He believed the church had fallen away from its ideals. Well, from what we've learned of medieval history, that doesn't really take a prophetic insight to realize that there's been a bit of a digression of moving away from the mainstream. Joachim thought that the latter, from this world to the next, was fraught with perils. And the church, in making this ascent from this world to the next, had slipped grievously on this ladder. Joachim linked apocalypticism with concrete past, present events, and of course wanted to postulate into the future. There is a deep pessimism that pervades his thought, and Joachim's ideas were predicated upon visions that he had, and thus he can be numbered among the mystics, but more specifically as a person caught up in apocalyptic spirituality. Joachim claimed to found his understanding of history not on specific divine communications like visions, but rather upon reading and interpreting Holy Scripture itself. Joachite theology and the theory surrounding him was novel. There's a dominant tendency in the Middle Ages to use the apocalypse in an individual and moralizing sense. Twelfth century thinkers began to use the apocalypse as prophecy for historical events and Joachim develops this sense. Future triumph would come after present tribulations. The symbolism of the apocalypse is historicized in Joachim's thought. Now this had implications in as much as Joachim saw this as a renewed monastic era. But what about the papacy? 
And what about the structures of the medieval church? It's possible in reading Joachim to see that perhaps he was suggesting that these would pass away. Uh, you can see where some of his enemies then came from. If history is to be remembered, is the remembered past, it is also the expected future. And people can no more ignore the latter than they can forget the former. Joachim of Fiora is one medieval Christian thinker occupied with the notion of the end. There were many, but now we must come to the devil. The next figure in our drama is the devil, who is the father of the Antichrist. The word devil comes from the Greek diabolos, meaning accuser. Now the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, used the word in Greek for the Hebrew Satan, from where we get our English Satan. Satan was not evil in the Old Testament, uh, but became identified with his functions which were perceived as evil. In fact, Satan is not even a character. It's more of a function or an office in the Old Testament. There's an entire theological evolution that we have to be aware of in moving from the Judeo-Hebrew world to the Christian world. Satan was the adversary, the opponent. But that doesn't necessarily make one evil just because you're an opponent. However, uh, in the New Testament, the Greek word satanus came to denote not a human but a divine opponent. So the opponent stands against God. Uh, that makes it evil. That makes Satan, Satan, as Christians came to understood. Now, in the Christian context, demons attack humans in order to impede the kingdom of God. I'm attempting to reflect now the medieval thinking and the mentality of medieval Christians. It's French poetry and popular imagination which adds to the devil the horns, the claws, the pitchfork, and a tail. Accordingly, the devil makes his appearance at all hours of the day and night, at every time in an individual's life, especially in times of birth, sickness, health, and death. Evil spirits, of which the world was filled in these Middle Ages, took particular pleasure in attempting to hinder the religious life, playing tricks in the choir when the monks were engaged in divine worship. Here they would blow the lights out, turn the hymn book to the wrong page, alter the tune. Yes, when things like this happened, when all of the candles blew out in the choir, it, it wasn't a gust of wind at all, it was the devil. And when these monks over here are singing the wrong song and these ones are singing another, that's the devil, not human error. You have to understand how deeply ingrained in the fabric of thinking this was. Sometimes a troop of demons would throw the entire choir into complete disarray by enjoining the two sides of the choir facing each other in medieval churches to sing disparately so that the two wings of the choir shouted hoarsely and discordantly to each other and it was just a big mess. Now in medieval art and literature there's no single standard depiction of the devil. He personifies evil and wickedness. But behind the mask of the devil, he appears variously in art as a bloated cannibal, a wise old man in some depictions, a malevolent monster on one hand, but in other depictions even as beautiful and somewhat grand. The devil tends to be a monstrous composite of human and animal. In the 15th and 16th centuries, I think when apocalypticism is reaching its crest, artists, artists like Dirk Bouts, uh, the Van Eycks, Hans Memling, Hieronymus Bosch, Peter Bruegel, and some of those, particularly in Northern Europe, pushed forward the idea of a grotesque devil. Up to the 11th century, though, Satan appears generally as human. From the 11th to the 13th centuries, this increasing grotesque is what personifies and visualizes the devil. Horns on 
his knees and calves and ankles. Faces appear uh, on the chest, the belly, and or the buttocks. The devil is usually dark or black, usually naked, or wearing only a loincloth, symbolic of sexuality and animalistic. He's often muscular or slim. Not very often is he big or fat. Seldom female, though I have been discovering in recent years lots of female demons. After the 11th century, the devil has horns. His hair is often in spikes on his head. Long, hooved, uh, hooked noses. Hooves and paws and hairy goat-like creatures. And he's usually armed. Sometimes breathing fire, shooting arrows, holding pitchforks, hooks, or other instruments of torture. And in hell, the demons are employed as executioners, though of course you never actually die in hell. And the tortures of the damned in hell become very explicit. And again, I'm pressing the point of how medieval Europeans thought. In Dante, for example, the Divine Comedy, the devil is a force operating throughout hell as well as throughout earth and will do so until the very end. But before the end, we have to have the third pillar of our medieval eschatological worldview, and that is the Last Judgment. As part of this worldview, with a look towards the end and the consummation of all things, there are images of death, images of judgment, of damnation, of hell. These were indelibly imprinted upon the minds, upon the consciousness of late medieval Christians. More than that, I'm prepared to argue they formed that consciousness. They weren't just part of it, they formed it. And the use of fear was vivid, and it impressed them itself upon medieval people. Terrors of the Last Judgment were described vividly by preachers in pulpits throughout Europe, portrayed in the same manner in various art forms that people could see in their daily lives. More than this, there was the abiding presence of the knowledge of the coming last four things. And the last four things are these, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. That's what's coming. Now there was a popular belief, current at the end of the 14th century, that held that nobody, since the beginning of the great schism, which was 1378, had gone to heaven. Nobody had gone to heaven. That meant everybody had either gone to hell or were in purgatory or somewhere, but what I'm trying to stress is that fear and negative thinking dominated theology and dominated the church and the lives of late medieval Christians. The most powerful and effective attempt to detail the description of the, this belief in hell is Dante's Inferno, part of his Divine Comedy. Now I ask you the question, was all of this the creation of late medieval Europe? Did Dante and these others simply create these visions? The answer to that has to be no. In terms of judgment, in terms of hell and suffering, there's a very long tradition from early Christianity through to Dante. If we look at hell in early Christianity, we will find the sorts of things, the motifs that dominate the later Middle Ages. From the Hans Memling workshop, there is an image which shows a demon standing on the backs of the damned in the flaming mouth of hell, which is in medieval iconography often shown as a gaping mouth of a big monster. This demon is standing upon the backs of the damned, holding a banner over his head upon which these words are written, there is no redemption from hell. Now that sums it up. If you go to hell, you're finished. In the Apocalypse of Peter, an early second century Christian document, Christ takes Saint Peter 
to paradise, shows him the wonders of the life of the blessed, and then takes Peter to another place where sinners are tortured. The descriptions are graphic in the apocalypse of St. Peter. Now the portrayals of the Last Judgment in the later Middle Ages appear in sculpture. We can find works of art on, in fresco, on canvas, in manuscript illuminations, and in drawings. Now, what I want to do at this stage of this lecture is to turn our attention to an analysis of hell. Hell tells us a great deal about the mentalities of Christians, about the church, and about society at large. The fresco on the west wall of the Arena Chapel in Padua, in Italy, executed in the early 14th century by Giotto, is an early example of this sort of thing. If you look at the detail of this fresco to the right and the lower aspects, you see disemboweled men hanging from trees, women hang by their hair, a man hung up by his genitals, dragons and beasts are devouring the damned, while other demons torment and abuse the damned. Now I want to mount an argument here based upon visual sources. Look now at A Last Judgment by Stefan Lochner, German about 1430, he shows the march of the damned to hell. Notice among this throng many monks, many church officials including bishops and cardinals, and in the jaws of hell itself on the lower right you see a pope being pushed and pulled into hell. But it's Taddeo de Bartolo's hell which appears in the Collegiate Church of San Gimignano in Italy near Siena. It's part of a series of Last Judgment frescoes dating from the period 1410 to 1415. The compartments of hell are very clear and they follow the outline of the medieval seven deadly sins. The seven deadly sins, of course, are pride, lust, gluttony, greed, envy, anger, and sloth. These things will take you to hell, and when you go to hell, you will be tormented. We look at Taddeo's hell, and at the top is Lucifer presiding. Notice the three ape-like faces. It's a parody of the Trinity. And with those three faces, he's eating sinners. One of them is Judas Iscariot. A close examination of the body reveals horns, <clears throat> scaly skin. He crushes nude figures against his knees. The victims writhe in pain. The blood spurts. You look closer. Where his genitals and his anus should be is another face. And he is excreting. He's defecating the consumed sinners into hell where they are further abused. You want to know what medieval Christians thought and how they viewed things? Our clues are here. And the argument continues. The argument will be intensified. Demons on either side of Satan. Remember, we're in a church. People saw this every Sunday when they came to church. The demons are using hammers and mallets and are abusing the poor, tormented sinners. We even know who they are because they're all wearing caps. And on their heads are their names. In this case, we find Herod. Simon Magus, Cain, Nebuchadnezzar, Pharaoh, and some secular figures. Now below Satan, and I won't go through this entire painting, there's a series of compartments that I mentioned are divided up equally into the seven deadly sins. In the compartment which depicts the gluttonous, we see six large figures. One of them is a tonsured friar, two women and a nobleman among them. They're gathered around a table. They're tied up and they can't reach the food, but the devils, devils are attacking them and the fire is burning them. If we look into the compartment of greed, we see a user at the bottom. He's lying on his back. His belly is swollen. There's a devil crouching on his chest and uh, in, in an obnoxious sort of way depositing gold coins into his mouth. 
Above him there are two demons, strangling a miser with a cord, to which a red tasseled money bag is attached. Two other demons in this compartment are feeding gold coins to a skeleton, who obviously exchanged his substance for the goods in the bundle hanging there with him. And to the lower right, a man is pierced through the heart with a dagger. Flames and snakes add to their misery. One other compartment in the collegiate church of San Gimignano, it's lust. In the upper left, you see a demon attacking a woman. On the right, there's an adulteress and a procurer trying to flee as a devil thrashes them. The procurer's flesh is torn with tongs, and below are two men, sexual sinners, being skewered and attacked by demons. Now, Taddeo de Bartolo's hell is inverted. The mouth is at the bottom. So, as one goes up the wall higher, you're going deeper into the recesses of hell until you actually get to Lucifer, who's way up at the top. The sins are then portrayed deliberately in a hierarchy of seriousness. In southern France, lest you think that perhaps Taddeo is just an exception to the rule, in southern France, in the Cathedral of San Cecil in Albi, which happens to be the largest brick building in the world, we find what is reputed to be the largest fresco of a last judgment ever executed. 54 feet wide by 51 feet high, and it dates to the late 15th century. Just a quick look at three uh, segments of that huge last judgment. Imploring sinners cry out in deep distress as demons torture them with fire. We see screaming hordes of the damned writhing in vats of fire. Gluttons are forced fed with snakes and toads and other terrible foodstuffs. Demons pour gross liquids into the mouths and terrified sinners are brutalized. Now I ask you this question, what sort of effect, psychological effect, do you think these sorts of vivid images would have upon ordinary Christians coming to the altar, coming to church Sunday after Sunday and seeing the punishments of the damned? Now, there's too many of these churches with last judgments. Almost every church had a last judgment, some of them very vivid. You can't argue that this was just the work of a few obscure artists. The bishops would have prohibited it had it not accurately, in some way, reflected medieval theology. No, I think that these visual images are clues into the mentalities, into the thinking of ordinary Christians and higher churchmen in the European Middle Ages. We come along a little bit further to the enigmatic work of Hieronymus Bosch. First 15 years of the 16th century are some of his more amazing, puzzling, and troubling representations, especially the Garden of Earthly Delights, which is a triptych and we look only at the right panel, which is hell. In this hell, devils torment the damned with their former pleasures. Bear in mind, what brings you pleasure in this life may be the instrument of your demise and torture in the next, at least according to Bosch and many other thinkers and artists of the time. The devils torment the damned with their former pleasures, and in this case, in what we, we might describe as a musical hell, because music and musical instruments are used to torment. Now, I could digress to say that music was viewed with some ambiguity in the Middle Ages. It was regarded as a subversive art, on one hand, capable of good or ill, could be used in the service of God, but certainly in the service of the devil, and the devil is making very good use of music here in Bosch's hell. We can only assume that in life these poor, wretched, condemned people enjoyed music because in hell they are tormented by it. There's an incessant clamor in Bosch's hell, and they try to cover their ears. 
One man is trapped inside of a drum, which a demon is pounding. Another carries a huge bassoon-like instrument. A red-faced fiend blows on a trumpet. Another is tortured on a harp, the body pierced by the taut strings, almost like a, a macabre crucifixion and snakes bite this poor unfortunate. Two demons place another person on a giant lute. And then we find a hideous choir. And this fanged frog demon, it's hard to describe some of Bosch's figures, is the conductor forcing a group of the damned to read the music of hell, which is imprinted upon a man's backside. One person is actually crushed beneath the giant music book and loot. And as we come to the, the very end of the Middle Ages, we find that Luca Signorelli executed one of the few last, major last judgments right at the turn of the 16th century. But the last that I want to mention of these depictions is that of Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican in Rome. This is a huge last judgment. 48 feet by 44 feet, not quite as big as the one in Albi, but more famous and certainly impressive. And it was accomplished between the years 1536 and 1540. The tortures of hell are mirrors of the tortures and the torments of late medieval society. In fact, it is absolutely possible to argue with a multitude of evidence that the tortures of hell are often the same as the tortures of criminals in society. The point I'm trying to make is that we're not dealing here really with artistic license on the part of artists. They're simply depicting in hell the way civil authorities dealt with people on earth in these centuries that make up the later Middle Ages. The punishments of hell then are essentially real, which is part of the reason why I would argue that people saw them in such a frightening way, because they, they knew this. They watched judicial torture and executions. And the primitive faith of medieval European Christians allowed the viewer to relate in an intimate way to depictions. If you go to Albi today, or the Sistine Chapel, or look at some of these works in museums, you're a little bit puzzled and you don't relate the same way to these products of the later Middle Ages the way a late medieval Christian would have. Were the viewers who went to church and saw these last judgments, these terrifying frescoes of hell, were they fascinated or horrified? I suggest both. I want to say something now that we've looked at some of these visual images, something about medieval Christian mentalities. What do these visual images tell us about the way that they conceived of themselves, their place in this world, and where everything was going? Well, in terms of medieval mentalities, last judgments, and I speak of the art form, reveal a variety of clues about late medieval culture. Remember, there is no separation of church and state in any meaningful sense in the Middle Ages. A comment you make about the church relates to society. What you say about society relates to the church in profound ways. Among the particular clues that we find in these last judgments are these, an obsession with sex and sexual activities. We find a preoccupation in these last judgments with good and evil, and clear lines of demarcation between the righteous and the damned. We find an abiding interest in issues of order and authority, and there's even order in hell, and authority, which is a preeminent problem, not only in the medieval church, but in the Christian church in our own times. We find a communal and an individualistic search for stability and security amongst a climate of uncertainty. 
There's an imaginative framework of the essentially unknown, that is to say, the life of the world to come. We could look at images of heaven and say the same thing. An imaginative depiction of what things might be like, because it is, in the end, the great unknown. There's an acceptance of traditional ideas. Uh, theology has to wait for the Luthers and the Calvins of the world to really turn theology on its head. There's an acceptance of the way things are. Communities of cruelty and torture and essential inhumanity, bordering on the fanatical, uh, are depicted in these pictures. And I'm speaking of the medieval church. A propensity for vengeance and avenging and revenge. And the full gamut of popular beliefs about things like monsters and punishment and animals and the demonic and death. Visual clues of cultures now gone. And I remind you that peasants didn't leave records and didn't write books and everything we know about them are what the people who were literate tell us. And they tell us painfully little. But I suggest that churches who contributed to have an artist depict something reflects perhaps in a more realistic way how some of these people felt, particularly when we know that some of these paintings were contracted specifically. Moreover, this genre of art, of knowledge, suggests that many medieval European Christians were gripped by the certainty of damnation. Look at this detail from Michelangelo's Last Judgment. This man's face shows the certainty that he knows he is damned, that he is going to hell as he's being pulled down the wall in the Sistine Chapel. The certainty of damnation, that medieval Christians were occupied with pain and torture by notions of what constituted sin and transgression. I don't think there's any question in the minds of medieval Christians as to what constituted sin. What constituted the transgression of the law of God? Oh, they knew all right because they were told very profoundly the idea that sex, which we've talked about in other contexts, was negative or at best ambiguous. We've heard about the Augustans of the world and the monastic tradition that was world-denying and flesh-denying. It's here, depicted in these visual images. Cruelty. Doctrinal truths and heresies are also to be found as clues amid these complex paintings. And of course, the five acts. Antichrist, judge, resurrection, judgment, separation are all part of this worldview. And those four last things that I mentioned previously are here in living color. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. And the idea that everything in life will be judged. I would also say there's a certain ambiguity with the church and the medieval system of religion that appears. In this detail of Bosch's hell, we see a fat pig wearing the veil of a Dominican nun. And she's kissing a reluctant man, trying to get him to sign a contract which is draped over his left leg, leaving his fortune to the church. The pig nun holds in her hand the quill, and there's an inkwell dangling just in front of the man. Now this suggests that he probably entered into this act on earth, but it didn't save him at all. He still went to hell, even though he'd given his inheritance and his riches to the church. And this preoccupation with death. I would suggest, as we move to a conclusion on this medieval eschatological worldview, that last judgments are a glimpse into certain aspects of the conceptual world of the later medieval church. Well, the dragon is the devil. The seven heads of Antichrist are the seven principal vices. This was part of the thinking of medieval Christians. 
The Antichrist presides over the vices of humans, instigating, giving some credence to the modern saying, the devil made me do it. You see, in the Middle Ages, the devil was always there. Depictions of people dying, the bed is surrounded by demons trying to get the person to sin. Angels trying to get the person to hold fast to the faith. It's a cosmic battle and microscopically depicted in individual people. Even the first modern man, Martin Luther, believed the world was full of demons. The trees, the grass, the woods. He heard, he saw the devil. There's nothing extraordinary about this. All humans are weak. All humans are equally weak in the face of such evil, in the face of such demonic onslaught. The eschatological worldview of the Middle Ages was not always clear, not always straightforward, and not even always orthodox. It was complex. It was complicated, as some of these images depict very well. However, we can say with absolute certainty that people did believe seriously in the end of the world and in the last judgment. If you have any doubt about that, read the wills of late medieval people who wanted to make sure that they were going to enter heaven in the right manner. Those views persisted. I would suggest these views of Antichrist, the devil, last judgment, they persist through the Middle Ages creating a widely held eschatological worldview. Indeed, mentalities have their long duration. And finally, there is some merit to the observation that only when people ceased to take seriously the eschatological worldview that the Middle Ages were really at an end.